I ended my last lesson telling you that for the last 20 years I've told numerous people that the word Easter in the King James Version of Acts 12 verse 4 is a mistranslation. I then told you that I no longer believe that to be true. I now believe that Easter is a good, scholarly, historical translation. I believe that the King James Bible translators did not make a blunder or miss a word when they put in Easter. I'd like to begin today by looking at the translators on the committee of the King James Bible. Now it's called the King James Bible because in the early 17th century King James of England commissioned 54 of the best learned Christian scholars to issue a new English translation of the Bible to be read and to be used publicly in the Church of England. Prior to 1611 there existed several English translations of the Bible done primarily in the 1500s and mostly by single individuals rather than a committee. A man by the name of Richard Bancroft, the Bishop of London at the time, constructed 15 translation principles to be used during the translation process. One of the principles was that the English translations from the 1500s be consulted and specifically the Bishop's Bible of 1568 to act as the guideline for their translation. The translators would not alter an already established English translation unless they felt strongly that an established translation did not correctly convey the Hebrew or Greek manuscripts available to them at that time. Lancelot Andrews, one of the chief directors of the King James Bible, he loved reading the Bible and preaching the Bible. His sermon delivery and powerful content earned him the title Angel in the Pulpit. Lancelot mastered at least 15 languages in his lifetime, including Arabic, Aramaic, and Syriac. Those who knew him well proclaimed him as a man of character and humility. He was a devout man who rose early in the morning, often spending five hours in prayer and meditation. People knew him as courageous, generous to the poor, and kind. John Aglionby was another translator, predominantly of the New Testament text. John began college at Oxford at the age of 16 in 1583. He graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1587, a Master's in 1590, a Bachelor of Divinity in 1597, and a Doctorate of Divinity in 1600. In his adult life, he was chaplain to Queen Elizabeth and King James I. He's described in a 17th century biography as a person well accomplished in all kinds of learning, profoundly read in the church fathers and in school divinity, an exact linguist. He was also a highly skilled debater and esteemed as one of the greatest students of the Greek language of any that lived in that age and kept correspondence with learned men in every part of the Christian world. Now that's just two out of the 54 translators. And I could keep going describing other highly skilled men that worked on the translation committee of the King James Bible. But my point is that these were not ignorant men. Were they perfect men? Of course not. Could they make mistakes? Of course. But they were more educated than the majority of Christians alive today. And that includes the majority of pastors and teachers in Christian churches. Bible historian Gordon Campbell wrote this in 2010. The population from which scholars can now be drawn is much larger than in the 17th century, but it will be difficult now to bring together a group of more than 50 scholars with the range of languages and knowledge of other disciplines that characterized the King James Bible translators. I want you to remember that these scholars were working together, not in isolation. In other words, one man can make a mistake much easier than 54. When something gets proved by 54 intelligent minds, a mistake is just not as likely. In the multitude of counsel, there is safety. Easter is usually put forth as a pagan blunder in the King James Bible by those in the Messianic Torah-keeping movement. And this includes myself in the past. For example, watch this video clip. And I want to read three different sources. The first one is from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. 
Very, very reputable source, by the way. This is not a fringe reference. This is very reputable and recognized by most Bible believers. And here's what it says about the origins of Easter. It says, the English word, and again, this is Easter, the word, comes from the Anglo-Saxon Esther, or Estera, a Teutonic goddess to whom sacrifice was offered in April. So the name was transferred to the Paschal Feast. Now, the word Paschal here refers to the Passover, not to the Easter. So we see here that Easter replaced Passover. Now, we know historically and scripturally that the only day the apostles and the Messiah observed in the New Testament was the Passover. Never once do we find Easter. We know, I know it's in the King James. Believe me, it's not in the Greek. It's not in the New Testament scriptures. It's simply missing from Acts 12, verse 4 was the first place I would go whenever I encountered a King James only person. I'd explain to them that Easter is a pagan term and it should say Passover and I'd point out that the Greek word behind the word Easter in Acts 12 verse 4 is the word Pascha or Pascha. And that's correct. That word has not changed. Pascha is the Greek term used in Acts 12 verse 4. And Pascha is a transliteration, letter for letter, from one language to the next. It's a transliteration from the Aramaic form. The Aramaic word is actually Pasha. It's the Aramaic form of the Hebrew word that we discussed in the last lesson, Pesach. Pesach is the word used in Exodus 12 that we know today in English as Passover. So Pasha is equal to Pesach. And Pasha is found 29 times in the Greek New Testament. One of those 29 times is in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 where we read that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, King James Version. The Greek word behind Passover is Pasha. This shows us that the King James translators used the English word Passover to translate Pasha into English. Another one of those 29 times is in the text from Luke 2.41 that we looked at in the last lesson where Yeshua's parents traveled to Jerusalem every year to keep the Pasha, it says in Greek. No doubt they were keeping the Pesach that originated in Exodus chapter 12. As a matter of fact, out of the 29 times the Greek New Testament uses Pasha, the King James Bible translators chose to translate that Greek word into English as Passover 28 times. Only one time did they translate it as Easter. So I would tell King James only advocates that I met, don't you think they missed that one? I mean, come on, 28 times Passover and one time Easter? But here's something to think about. Knowing that the King James Bible translators were learned scholars much more than anyone I personally know in the Messianic Torah-keeping movement, and knowing that they knew the word Pasha could be properly rendered as Passover, remember they did so 28 times, should we believe that all 54 of them just made a mistake and put the name of a pagan goddess in Acts 12 verse 4? I think that is highly unlikely. And I now know they did not mess up. I used to believe they made a mistake because of a lack of knowledge and study on my part for the last 20 years. I thought I had studied the word Easter sufficiently, but I had not done my due diligence. At this point, let me say that there can be no doubt that Pasha means Pesach. If it is a transliteration of the Aramaic form of Pesach, which is a Hebrew word, then Pasha means the same thing as Pesach. It means the Passover. Acts chapter 12 verse 4 is talking about the Passover. Now, let me also say at this point that I still believe Easter is a legitimate English translation of Pasha. I know that sounds confusing to many of you right now, but please bear with me. I'm going to do my best to untangle what seems to be confusing. Sometimes when we're becoming unconfused, it can be confusing. In studying this subject, I have ran across an explanation given by most King James only advocates for the word Easter in Acts 12 verse 4. These people do believe that Easter is an exclusively pagan word describing an ancient fertility goddess. 
and that the King James translators used Easter in Acts 12 verse 4 to refer to a pagan festival as opposed to the biblical festival of the Passover and unleavened bread. I'll let a King James only believer explain it to you. He showed me what looks like a genuine mistranslation in the King James Bible, and he was showing me Acts chapter 12, I think it's verse 4, where it says the word Easter. Mm -hmm. Well, he said that's Pascha, the Greek word Pascha shows up 29 times in the New Testament, and every time it's translated as Passover, mm -hmm. except for this one time in Acts chapter 12, yeah. it's Easter, which looks like a mistranslation, and he said you should have known that, but I mean, is that true that the word Pascha shows up 29 times in the New yeah. Testament? Yeah, 29 times it appears in the New Testament, and 28 times it's translated Passover, and the one time that it's not is Easter right here in Acts chapter 12. But isn't that a mistranslation then? Or? <laughs> no, actually it's one of the strongest evidences, Justin, of why you want a King James Bible to nothing else. And long before it was associated with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Easter was a pagan holiday. It had a female deity known as the Queen of Heaven. Uh, it was, uh, her name was Astarte or Estar. Uh, it was a celebration of the earth regenerating itself after a tough winter when everything was dead. And because it was a, about regeneration, the symbols were an egg and a rabbit, and it was associated with the vernal equinox as far as a date. So every year the date changed. Uh, it can happen anywhere between March 22nd and April 25th. So it was a pagan holiday long before it was ever associated with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the information I just gave you comes from a source called Hyssop's Two Babylons, which is a great historic source. And it's all accurate. But there's a problem, and the problem is it's not an inspired book. Now I'm always hammering you guys in class about what our final authority is. What is it? The Bible. The Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. We may go to something like Hyslop's Two Babylons just for some information that the Bible doesn't have, historic information, but it's not inspired. We need to finish this. We need to finish all studies with the authority of Scripture. So we need to see what the Bible has to say about Easter. Actually, we need to see what the Bible says about the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. Because Peter was arrested during those Days of Unleavened Bread. And we need to see what that relationship is, and the Bible is the only place we're going to find that. Here, have a seat. Now the first Passover was found in Exodus chapter 12. And it tells us that it was in the first month, which is according to Exodus chapter 13 verse 4, the month of Abib. It was on the 14th day of the month, the Lord passed over. Now the Lord only passed over Egypt and killed the firstborn one night, not seven, not eight. Keep that in mind for later. And then the next day on the 15th to the 21st are what the Bible calls the days of unleavened bread. I, I kind of get what you're saying, it's just not very clear. Well, that's why we go back to the Bible for our final authority. Look at Leviticus chapter 23. Look at verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Look at the next verse. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Now, go to Numbers chapter 28. In verse 16, and in the fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. Verse 17, and in the fifteenth day of this month is the feast seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. By the way, you remember how the, the date for Easter changes? Mm -hmm. The date for the Passover never changes. It does not move from year to year. In Numbers chapter 9, the Bible tells what the children of Israel did. They kept the Passover, the, the next Passover. The first one out of Egypt, one year later after they left, they kept it on Abib 14, and on the 15th to the 21st, they kept the days of unleavened bread. Well, I heard somewhere that all eight days together were considered the Passover, Abib 14 through 21. So Herod, maybe there were some days left over. You know, Herod was waiting for, you know, like after the Passover. Waiting the last few days of the Passover waiting to be the last passed. Few, yeah. The people that don't like the King James Bible make it up as they go. There is nothing in Scripture that says that. Now, Justin, if somebody says in Bible times or in the Bible, however they want to say it, if they say all eight days are called the Passover, then there should be a, a verse that they got that from. Where did they get that? Either made it up in their mind or they got it from the Bible. You have a right to say, show me that in the Bible. Show me someplace in the Bible where it says all eight days are called the Passover. Fact is, not found anywhere. Hmm. Fact is, just the opposite. Take a look at Numbers chapter 33. 
Now, this is not the opinion of a man. This is not my opinion, by the way. This is why, this is why I've always told you, the Bible is our final authority, not Sam Gipp, not any, anybody else, no scholar. This is the authority, and look what it says in verse 3. Numbers 33, 3, it says, talking about the children of Israel getting out of Egypt. And they departed from Ramses in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month, on the morrow after the Passover. Hmm. There is scriptural authority that the 15th of Abib, the Passover is already passed. It's very similar if they arrested a noted criminal on December 28th, and the news people asked the sheriff, when are you going to arraign him? And he said, after Christmas. But he was arrested after Christmas. But the next coming holiday, they'd say, after New Year's. We arrested him after Christmas. We're waiting till after New Year's. So the King James Bible is the only Bible that correctly translates that 28 times Passover and one time Easter. By the way, in Greece, when Greeks say Easter's coming, Pascha is the word they use. Well, I thought I saw on a Jewish calendar that that whole week, all eight days, is, is called the, the Pascal week. Or... Yeah, I've seen that too. But remember, that's not the inspired Bible. That's what the Jews say. And these are the guys that didn't recognize their Messiah when he was standing right in front of them. I don't think I'm going to worry about what they thought of the, of, of the Passover. You believe that Jesus Christ was God? Yeah. All right. Was he ever wrong? No. Okay, do you think he was ever just maybe mistaken? Never. Never. The night he was arrested, he sent two of his disciples, and he said, go tell that man, I want that upper room, to keep the Passover with my disciples. Then he was arrested that night, and he was dead the next day. So if the Passover in the Bible was eight days, he never did what he said he was going to do. He never kept the Passover. But if the Passover is one day, he did it, and then it was taken care of. So Justin, the Passover is Abram 14. 15 through 21 are the days of unleavened bread. Peter was arrested right in there somewhere. So the Passover was already passed. Herod couldn't be waiting for something to pass that was already passed. He was waiting for the future, Easter, to pass. And our King James Bible has it right. Well, that settles that. No, that doesn't settle that. <laughs> The contention is that since Peter was placed in prison during the Days of Unleavened Bread, the Passover had already happened because Passover takes place before the Days of Unleavened Bread. So they say it had to be the pagan festival of Easter or Ishtar, which came after the Days of Unleavened Bread. That's the one Herod was waiting to pass in Acts 12, verse 4. Now, this explanation is rather easily refuted. Number one, the Greek word used in Acts 12 verse 4 is Pasha, Pesach, the same word that we've been explaining. It means the holy day established in Exodus 12. Number two, the days of unleavened bread are mentioned right in the context of Acts chapter 12. And number three, there are times in Scripture where the term Passover, contrary to this video, is used as shorthand for the entire eight days, the 14th through the 21st of Abib. Ezekiel 45, 21 and Luke 22, verse 1 both show that this is the case. In the first month, in the 14th day of the month, you shall have the Passover, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. That's the Ezekiel passage. Now Luke 22, 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. This doesn't mean that every time the word Passover is used, it's a reference to the entire feast. But what these texts show is that sometimes the word Passover can be used as a reference to the entire feast. And the same author that wrote Acts 12 and 4 wrote Luke 22 and 1. In the front of the 1611 King James Bible, there's a chart titled, How to Find Easter Forever. It is a help to find where Easter falls on the church calendar each year. Now, there's more to the history of the calculation of Easter, but let me briefly mention at this point that Easter is calculated by finding the first full moon after the spring equinox and then by taking the Sunday that follows that full moon. So Easter falls on a different date on our calendar each year, and that is because it is in part determined by the biblical solar lunar calendar. 
When the King James translators included a chart in their Bible translation on how to find Easter, were they trying to find a pagan festival? Well, of course not. They were charting out when to keep the festival of their church that celebrated the death and resurrection of Christ. And there are other charts in the front of the 1611 King James Bible showing that the translators did not believe Easter to be a pagan holiday. They mentioned certain psalms to be sung on Easter or lessons to be read on Easter. And the point is this. It shows that when the King James translators used Easter in Acts 12 verse 4, they were not writing in the name of a pagan festival of Ishtar or Astarte. That's not what they thought Luke was writing about when he wrote in Greek, Pasha. It is so common among Torah-keeping believers to believe the word Easter itself is an exclusively and originally pagan. That is a pagan word. You'll hear people say that Easter is Ishtar or Astarte or even Asherah in Old Testament Scripture. And I used to say the same thing, so I'm not knocking everybody else besides me. I'm putting myself in that same category. That's ignorant, unlearned, and foolish. The problem is that when we who are not educated on ancient languages or the proper etymology of words, when we hear Easter or Ishtar, we automatically think that just because there is a similarity in the sound, they must be the same thing. Now, I want you to couple this ignorance with the fact that most in the Torah-keeping movement are so quick to accept something as pagan simply because somebody says it is pagan and simply because it sounds good. We've got now with the Internet and especially on Facebook something I like to call meme theology where somebody thinks all they have to do is share a meme and they've proven their point. And if you've got a picture of a fertility goddess and a couple of good one-liners on the meme, you've proven your point and you can go on about your day and never do any serious scholarly study. I want to present to you that the word Easter has Germanic roots and is basically a word that means East or Eastern, referring to the springtime due east sunrise at the time of the spring equinox. Here's the explanation of the prefix East from Oxford's online etymological dictionary. Old English East, Easton, adjective, adverb, East, easterly, eastward, east, noun, from Proto-Germanic ost, east, literally toward the sunrise. Source also of Old Frisian ast, east, aster, eastward, Dutch oost, Old Saxon ost, Old High German osten, German ost, Old Norse ost, from the east, from P-I-E root os, to shine, especially of the dawn. The east is the direction in which dawn breaks, for theory of shift in the geographical sense in Latin C, austral. That's a tongue full of words. <laughs> but you can see in the etymology that the direction of the rising of the sun is what we are dealing with here. It's not much of a leap in English to go from saying Easter to Eastern. The reality is they mean the same thing. When you look up the actual word Easter in this same etymological dictionary, you find this definition. Old English Easter Dig from Eastre, Northumbrian Eostre from Proto-Germanic Ostron, Dawn, also the name of a goddess of fertility in spring, perhaps originally of sunrise, whose feast was celebrated at the spring equinox, from Ost, East, toward the sunrise. Compare East from P-I-E root Os to shine, especially of the dawn. Now, I am certain my Hebrew roots friends will point out to me the connection here with a goddess of fertility, and it is possible, it is debated, but it is possible that there was later, hundreds of years after the first century A.D., a goddess named Eostre worshipped by the Germanic and Anglo-Saxon peoples in the springtime. I do believe there is legitimate etymological connection between Eostre and Easter, because they both come from the Germanic root ost or east. But I'd like for us to think a little deeper here. It makes sense for the Germanic word east, ost, 
that has to do with dawn and sunrise to be a word that Germanic and Anglo-Saxon peoples used to name this goddess they worshipped in the springtime. In other words, the word itself is not a pagan word. They used the word to describe a goddess who was celebrated during a spring pagan festival. That does not mean that the word Easter only means this pagan goddess. It just means it was applied to this pagan goddess. And yes, bunnies and eggs and fertility rites have nothing to do with Yeshua and his resurrection. All of that is certainly extra-biblical, post-biblical, and may have been connected with the worship of Eostre in the spring by Germanic peoples. I'm not suggesting that anyone start associating these practices with the resurrection of Yeshua. But what all this does not prove is that the word Easter itself is a pagan word. It's not. Easter is a Germanic word that originally had to do with the location of the rising of the sun in the spring season. When we say the sun rises in the east, we could just as easily say the sun rises in the eastern direction. Christians took the rising of the sun in the east as a picture of the resurrection of Christ from the dead, and they called it Easter, or dawn, sunrise. What happened was this. Follow carefully. In the 2nd century A.D., there was a split in the early church over when to celebrate Pasha as a memorial of the death and resurrection of Yeshua. Some chose the 14th of Abib, and others chose the Sunday that came after the 14th of Abib. But at this time in church history, both groups called the day Pasha. The group that celebrated on Sunday focused on the resurrection, but still called Resurrection Day Pasha, or Passover, as we would say. This is because the resurrection of Christ is closely associated with the death of Christ. Later on, around the 8th century A.D., the German word Ost or East, meaning sunrise or dawn, came to be a secondary name for Pasha. While Pasha is a word that is more focused on the death of Christ, Easter is a word more focused on the resurrection of Christ. Easter, like Pasha, came to be a way to refer to both the Passover in ancient Israel and the new Passover in the Christian church. The word Easter was used long before the word Passover was ever coined as an English equivalent of Pasha. So now let me get your mind stirring for the next lesson. <laughs> the King James translator's use of Easter in Acts 12.4 was actually a carryover from an established practice of old English-speaking peoples that used the word Easter to describe the Hebrew Pesach. And one quick example is William Tyndale's translation of 1 Corinthians 5 and 7 in his 1526 New Testament. For Christ our Esther Lamb is offered up for us. Let me also pique your curiosity a bit more for the next lesson. <laughs> Many Messianic Torah-keeping believers think that any time they hear the word sun, sunrise, or east associated with the Messiah, it's got to be pagan. But is that the case? What does the Bible really say? Well, you have to wait till lesson number three. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.